Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. This video is going to be part two of whether or not Bitcoin can realistically hit a price of $1 million. Now part one was very popular guys. We examined some of the more macro views on why Bitcoin could see an inflow of money and reach a million dollars. Check that video out if you haven't already, but let's get into part two. Now to start off with, I always laugh when we see people saying Bitcoin's dead. It's happened every year since I've been in this space in 2012. It's a volatile asset class that has these big run-ups and these big pullbacks, guys. But each time we look back and laugh, just like in 2013 here, I believe that the current run-up and correction is going to be a little blip on the radar as we make our journey further forward. So let's dive in and have a look at what it would take to get Bitcoin to a price of a million dollars. And is that a realistic market cap? First thing I want to talk about is how many Bitcoins are lost. Now, personally, I think it's somewhere around 25%. So if there's 18 million Bitcoins out there currently, you know, somewhere around four or five million could realistically be lost out of circulation. Now, every day on social media, you see this, you know, I lost my private key. You read about a hard drive in a tip. Bitcoin's been around for 10 years now. People are going to start to die and it's all those little things. I know it's a bit grave to talk about, but people don't realize that there's no way to back this up. It's not like, you know, shares that get handed down or that sort of thing. Once you don't have your private key, it's lost and gone forever, guys. And the number of Bitcoins in circulation doesn't ever come back. They are out of circulation forever. There's less out there for people to buy on exchanges, reducing that total circulating supply. Next thing to talk about is the top 100 addresses. Now, these are people that are very loyal to Bitcoin a lot of the time. They're not, you know, not people that are here to, to dump. They very rarely withdraw. And it comes back to this HODL mentality of people that are part of this movement and they're here for the long run. So the HODL mentality, you know, it's been about for a few years now since this misspelling, you know, hold on for dear life. But it's almost become, you know, a cult of people that HODL and, and aren't going to sell. They're here for the long run. They believe in this stuff. You hear stories about people now giving hardware wallets to their newborns saying you can't open that to your 18 or 21. All those sort of things, guys, it's really taking the number of Bitcoins that are available to purchase on exchanges, you know, away from that supply. And the basics of supply and demand, all these things put upwards pressure on the price. A similar vein of thought is the ETFs. So once we have a large number of Bitcoins having to be held by these firms that run the ETFs, again, it's taking a huge amount of Bitcoin off the actual supply. So they have to be physically backed by Bitcoins rather than futures and other derivatives that just track the price. This is actually going to require a large amount of Bitcoins to be backing the ETF for people to invest in. Again, it's just taking them off the actual exchanges to, for the supply and demand metrics. Next thing I want to talk about is a number of people that sold too soon. So you hear the stories of riches, but a lot of people won't tell you that they maybe bought Bitcoin at a dollar but sold at two dollars. And even if we continue this journey and maybe in a few years' time we do get to that million dollar mark, it doesn't mean that everyone that bought, you know, at a dollar is going to be ridiculously rich. So many people sell too soon and on the charts we see it go up and down, guys. People get shaken out each time. People get to a point that they're happy with and that then they want to buy back in if they've sold at the wrong time. So there's always you know, people that are getting out at the wrong time and they often want to get back in. So that's another thing that's continually putting that upwards pressure on the price. And you, people just think that, oh, everyone that's going to buy is going to get rich. It's not that easy. We're seeing it now with big shakeouts along the way. It's a volatile asset class, guys, and lots of people sell at the wrong point. Next thing is market dominance. So altcoins, you know, last year really fell into favor when Bitcoin dropped its dominance from 85% down to below 40 and altcoins had a big run. And everyone sort of went chasing the altcoin space thinking that's where the money was to be made and Bitcoin was never going to be in favor again. And then Bitcoin really came back with a vengeance towards the end of the year and it could drop off again now. But I think that's a cycle you're going to see continue where the new people in the space find Bitcoin, then they chase altcoins, and then Bitcoin goes up and they chase that. And again, it's that cycle of getting in and out of the market at the wrong time, dumb money and the herd doing the wrong thing at the wrong time that continually is going to lead people towards Bitcoin as that sort of one coin that everyone should maybe have in that portfolio if that's the way you want to think about it. And in terms of proof of work coins, I believe Bitcoin is going to prove to the market why it is maybe one or two that do actually need proof of work. So I recently did this video about proof of work versus proof of stake. 
And we're seeing more 51% attacks on proof of work coins. Now, some of them have different mining algorithms. I don't want to get into all that. But the fact is that majority of coins are going to move away from this proof of work model, I believe. And the fact that Bitcoin is the most secure and has the, the huge amount of hashing power we see, it doesn't work well for these smaller coins. It's a model that works well for security and having the largest network. And people are going to start to realize that, hey, Bitcoin gets the most benefit from being the most secure proof of worst work network. And people are going to come back to it for that reason, I believe. Next up is this sort of thought process we hear about, oh, who's going to buy a Bitcoin if it's $100,000? And people just don't realize that it's very easy to divide by eight decimal places. But I also believe we're going to see a change in the nomenclature. So people saying, you know, oh, it's too hard to work out all these decimals. In the future, I believe we'll start quoting things in Satoshis and maybe we talk about, you know, houses or very expensive items in terms of Bitcoin. But for everyday living, people are going to become more familiar with using Satoshis to value things. Just like we have dollars and then cents with two decimal places, people are going to get very familiar with Bitcoin in the eight decimal place system. Maybe even we see some changes in the nomenclature to terms and units that people become even more familiar with in the meantime as well. The next thing is, you know, the erosion of the purchasing power of fiat currencies. Now, some people say, careful what you wish for. Maybe Bitcoin gets to a million dollars, but that means an Apple is worth a thousand dollars because the US dollar has lost so much of its purchasing power. So this chart's pretty famous. You know, all this stuff, money printing, centrally planned banking has led to wealth inequality, Erosion of the purchasing power. Um, this is a trend that's not stopping anytime soon, guys, with governments printing money. And they take it in turn. So, you know, the US did QE. Japan's been doing it for years. Then, you know, the, the Bank of England do it. European Union has their turn. So, guys, it's just a baton passing contest for who's debasing their currency and printing more money at any one time. So we look at a technical chart. You know, the US dollar's been as high as 120. Some people are saying it's in a downtrend now. You know, every time this drops, guys, it just puts that big upwards pressure as the US dollar is the denominator. It's what we quote Bitcoin in the majority of the time. So if the US dollar and all fiat currencies in general continue to lose value, guys, and be debased, that is putting huge upwards pressure on the price of Bitcoin. The next thing is the block reward. So very basics here, supply and demand economics, guys. In 2020, the block reward get halved. So the, the number of new Bitcoins that is entering circulation is 50% less. Now, that's very much putting upwards pressure on the price. I believe this is going to start to get priced in next year. In terms of speculation, we see this a lot. When everyone starts to talk about something, it gets priced in already. But look, put, putting that aside, the fact is over the long run, the number of Bitcoins being less is going to put a lot of upwards pressure on the price. We're really heading along this curve now to the point where it's seriously starting to flatten. And if we get the opposite happening in terms of the number of users continuing to grow exponentially, that's really you know a double whammy in terms of putting upwards pressure on the Bitcoin price. And then it really flattens off here, guys, from 2030 all the way through to 2140, 100 years from now when the last Bitcoin um, will be created. Speaking of central banks, I want to talk about interest rates. So, you know, interest rates have been coming down forever. We live in a world that in a debt-based money system that's based on exponential growth, but we live on a finite planet where, we, you know, we have limited resources and all that sort of thing, guys. So the rubber's going to hit the road, as I like to say, and central banks are now at the point where some of them are in neg negative territory. Now, if we have another recession and, you know, economic downturn, let alone a market crash, governments are going to central banks print more money, but some of them are going to have to take interest rates seriously negative. Now, there's some countries like Australia where we're currently sitting at, you know, one and a half percent still. But what happens when the majority of countries around the world are at zero or negative interest rates? Why aren't investors going to want to become their own bank and sit on an asset like Bitcoin that doesn't have a negative interest or even stable cryptocurrency coins, guys? You know, anything, it's just going to be very appealing as an asset class if interest rates continue to turn down, just like we're seeing with, you know, bond yields and interest rates globally. So next up, what percentage of people actually own Bitcoin? Now, I don't really agree with this, you know, 5% of people own Bitcoin. This is from January, guys, but... If you have a look, there's about 20 million users on Coinbase. You know, that's a, a global website now, the, the biggest number of users. 
The top 100 Bitcoin addresses here suggest that there's about, um, on this website, about 25 million Bitcoin addresses. So if we go over and do some math, let's just do 25 million addresses divided by the population of the planet. It's about 0.3%. Now, you know, personally, people that are in this space for a while have probably got 100 Bitcoin addresses. You know, wallets like Jacks give you a new address each time. You know, old old addresses, you know, new exchanges, multiple exchanges, guys. I'd say the average person's probably got 10, and even that's probably been a little bit lean. But even that puts it at 0.03% of the population actually being in cryptocurrency. So there's still a very long way to go, guys, in terms of people that are in this space. Next up, central banks again. How much money have they printed? So their balance sheets here, you know, the US Fed's balance sheet, it's gone from less than a trillion in 2008 in the GFC to over four trillion. And the biggest four combined is sitting at, you know, up around $40 trillion. So never before has, has there been so much money in existence washing around the world, sitting on different balance sheets and in different banks. It's looking for a home. We've seen asset price you know, inflation in housing, stock markets, the price of living and everything going up, guys. And there's still lots of money out there. Look at margin debt. People want to park their money somewhere and seek a return. Now, as everything gets overextended and valuations get even more ridiculous, people are going to look around and Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is a new asset class. It's uncorrelated. It offers tech exposure. Everyone loves those tech stocks trading on huge PEs, the promise of future returns. All that's the same sort of concept as to why I think Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is going to capture a lot of that money, put a lot of pressure upwards on the price. Next up, we've got money. What is money? Is Bitcoin trying to compete with Forex? I think the stats are if Bitcoin captures 10% of Forex reserves at puts it at a price of around a million dollars. And that's without all those lost Bitcoins and addresses and everything else we spoke about. But the main functions of money are, you know, medium of exchange and, and store of value. And two people will tell you they use Bitcoin for different reasons. Some people say, I want to be my own bank and use it as a store of value. Other people will say, hey, I like that I can send money censorship resistant across any border. It's digital, it's fast, it's far cheaper than banks. So it's different things to different people. But the point is it can be both guys. And if Bitcoin just can disrupt all these little industries one at a time, let alone become a Forex reserve, you know, sort of reserve currency of sorts, it's going to capture a huge amount of money. Finally, we've got the consumption and the adoption rate of new technologies, and it's spreading faster than ever before. So look, people say Bitcoin's a bubble like tulips. Tulips don't have a real world use case. Look at electricity, you know, microwaves, the internet, new technologies that become part of our everyday lives, guys, they're not bubbles. Maybe that they can get ahead of themselves in the short term in terms of price like the dot-com bubble, but they're here to stay. They continue to be used by everyone you know, the world over, and I really think we are here, guys. We're so early on in this story in terms of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin getting adopted, being used in everyday lives as that money, store of value, medium of exchange, whatever you want to call it, guys, but we're so early on in those percentages that I spoke about in terms of everyone using it. And just finally, I touched on this the other night, market cap. Just because someone pays a price for something doesn't mean it's actually that much money needing to go into something to push up the price. So the example here, 1 million coins, price $10, it's a $10 million market cap. If one person pays $20 on the exchange, that increases the market cap by $10 million, even though there's actually only been $20 flow into the ecosystem. So keep in mind, all those things I spoke about that, you know, the supply and demand metrics taking coins that are available off the exchanges. It can lead to people paying very high prices and it doesn't mean that we have to have those huge amounts of money even flow in per se in terms of market cap to greatly increase the theoretically perceived value what we see as the market cap, guys. So I know I've touched on a lot of different things that today. I hope you've enjoyed that. Take the longer term perspective. I know it sucks when Bitcoin's been going down for six months, guys, but it really is, um, you know, all part of the fun in the longer scheme of things. And I think we're still very early on in this journey. So please hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around. And as always, thanks for tuning in guys. Cheers.